We are headed to Acts chapter 8 this morning. We continue to do today what we've done for 74 Sundays together. And that is to simply uh, follow the Bible's New Testament historical narrative regarding the events immediately and subsequently following the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. That New Testament historical narrative is called the book of Acts, chronicling as it does the uh, post-ascension acts of Christ Jesus by God the Holy Spirit through the disciples of Jesus, also known as the church. And we've made it here in these 74 weeks to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Now, since chapter 5 of this account, the attention and conflict between the leaders of the church of Jesus in the first century city of Jerusalem and the leaders of the city itself, that tension between the two, that conflict between the two has steadily grown more pronounced. It has indeed to this point remained a conflict between leaders. The leaders of the church, known as apostles and deacons, and the political and religious leaders of the city, known as the great Sanhedrin, which has this very day in our text, without any sort of due process, in a proceeding which has been an illegal combination of religious regulation and mob violence murdered one of the leaders of the church named Stephen by beating him to death with rocks because he has preached the truth about Jesus that the Sanhedrin hates. They hate Jesus. They hate the truth of and about Jesus. They hate anyone who speaks the truth. And they certainly hate those who have the gall to apply the truth to them in a way which suggests that they are accountable to God for their actions and in such a way which clearly reveals that even according to the scriptures that they claim to revere, they are wicked, anti-God, and anti-Christ men. That's what the Holy Spirit through Stephen has done. And they have killed Stephen for it. Now, chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting to his, that is Stephen's, death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. These four verses will occupy us for three or four weeks, recording, as they do, some of the most significant events in human history. These four verses record some of the most significant events in human world changing if if you will eternity 
under the sovereignty of God, de- eternity determining events are here recorded for us to study. And so let's do that, praying for God the Holy Spirit to help us to see deeply into this account today and over the next few weeks in order to understand the gravity of what we're seeing and how it's still, these events in these four verses, still affecting history to this day, still affecting, if you will, eternity, including our corporate and personal histories and our corporate and personal eternities to this moment. Brother Stu, would you lead us in that prayer for the Holy Spirit to help us to see what we're supposed to see from this text over the next few weeks? Come, Holy Spirit. Open our minds. Open our hearts. Speak through your messenger this morning. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. us. I pray for your help. So that we might better understand, pray for your help. better receive, and better act upon what will be preached this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Move up and down the pews. Amen. In Jesus. Touch each of us in our minds, in our hearts in our very spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. And even as we begin our study this morning, let's be mindful and prayerful. Being mindful does nothing um, if we're not prayerful. Being mindful is is, uh, like sending good vibes, right, to to people. Um, But let's be mindful and prayerful Regarding Brother Gary, as he stands to preach this morning at Let's, and uh, Brother Avery, who is standing with him this morning to help uh, lead worship uh, through song. Um, Praise the Lord for those guys and that they are able and willing to do that. Today we're going to study just one thing. It's, It's number one on our outline. It's what I'm calling the frenzy. The frenzy. The dictionary definition of frenzy is a state of extreme mental agitation or wild excitement, a burst of agitated activity, a fit or spell of mental derangement, a mania. All those come right out of just an English dictionary. And it's what we're starting to see now and we'll continue to see in greater measure, one more time, a state of extreme mental agitation or wild excitement, a burst of agitated activity, a fit or spell of mental derangement, a mania. That's what begins now to unfold on the pages before us. Verse 1. At that time, a great persecution, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. A great persecution. Okay, this is no longer just tension. This is no longer a a conflict just between leaders. This is now a declaration of war upon the entire church there in the city. And we will eventually see that this declaration of war against the church includes war against men, women, and children. Now I'm using the word frenzy. That word is used to describe, isn't it? What happens when some blood is introduced into a situation of hunger and the sense and sensibility of predators is overwhelmed by the amount of prey available? 
and the sense of vulnerability in that prey. It results in what we call a feeding frenzy. The Psalms especially are full of prayers for deliverance from those who are, the Bible calls them, bloodthirsty. Psalm 59.2 is an example. But the Psalms are full of it. Deliverance from those who are thirsty for blood. A great persecution rose against the church. When the Apostle Paul much later looks back upon this season of great persecution, as we'll eventually see, he reveals that many Christians in the city there in Jerusalem were killed during this frenzy. The studies of some reliable historians conclude that as many as a few thousand members of the Jerusalem church were slaughtered during this great persecution. That's as many people as we lost in the events of 9-11-01. We lost that many Christians in a single city during the frenzy of this great persecution. Says Matthew Henry, when the fury of the Jews ran with such violence and to such a height against Stephen, it could not quickly either stop itself or spend itself. Brothers and sisters, let us never imagine that we can start sinning in some way and then stop before it gets too extreme. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's not think that we can start sinning in some way and and then stop it before we get in some way caught. It, It just doesn't work like that. A spark has found its way into the powder keg and the deadly fireworks now are exploding all over the city. And the same thing will happen in our lives if we are not careful to work through temptation without sinning. It will blow up in our face and in the faces of others around us too. And, and, and those explosions can go forward into generations. The explosion that we see here at Acts 8 still affecting history today. Do not be deceived, says Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Let us never think that we can that we can start sinning a little bit and then stop it whenever we want. And Numbers 32, 23 says, you can be sure your sin will find you out. They had run at Stephen, killed Stephen, and now it's as if they can't stop running. They're going downhill, if you will, and they can't just pull up on a dime They can't stop running and they can't stop killing. Jesus had told his people as recorded in John 16 too, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he's offering God service. And that time in history on the pages before us has arrived. The frenzy. Letter A. It has leadership. And that leader is Saul. This frenzy has leadership. Saul. Now, as much as we can, and we can't do this totally, but as much as we can, I want us to just continue to experience this narrative as we read it over the shoulder of its original reader. Remember Theopolis? from the very first verse of the book, we're just reading along with him for the most part. Therefore, all we know about this man named Saul at this point 
is what we see from the book's first mention of him, which is verse 58 of chapter 7, which tells us nothing more really other than the fact that he's young. And in ancient Eastern writing, that can mean anywhere from probably about 20 to about 40. All right, if you're over 40, even biblically, you can't claim to be young. We don't, know, we don't know anything else about Saul right now, okay? Now we do, and I know we do, but I'm just trying to have us to experience this narrative the way it was meant to be experienced. We don't know anything else about Saul right now except what begins to emerge here, and that is that he's the clear leader of the great persecution, the great violent frenzy which arises against the church in Jerusalem. Pretty much any kind of effective movement, and this movement against the church is effective if 3,000 of our brothers and sisters were slaughtered in the city. Any kind of effective movement or ministry rises or falls with leadership. We, we've already seen that in this book of Acts, almost from the beginning, where the first order of business of the newly birthed church was to find a leader to replace Judas. We've seen this all through the book. And I want you to think about all the ministries which comprise the capital M ministry of the church. Think of all the ministries. Think of the ministries you see going on in this room from back there to over here to up here to over there and, and some that are invisible. All ministries which comprise the ministry of the church with rare exception, the reason those ministries continue to exist is that someone's willing to lead it. I guarantee if uh, things that you, we, we, we take for granted, if, some, if, if, Holly, if Holly had not been willing to lead the projection ministry, I guarantee you'd be dead right now. You would not be seeing anything on the screen. Same thing with Art back there, and I don't want to get into mentioning a bunch of names, although I just did, but I didn't mean to. But almost any ministry continues to exist primarily because someone's willing to lead it. In a lifetime of church involvement, I have found that plenty of people seem to know what should be done and what ought to be done and what somebody needs to do. But much fewer people are willing to lead that thing they say needs done and sustain that thing they say needs done. Well, this guy, Saul, for reasons that we'll discover way down the road, not only thinks that the Jesus movement needs to be stopped and somebody ought to stop it, he's also willing to lead that effort. So, looking now at verse 3, please, he makes, the New King James translation says, havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women. Now, I said it involves men, women, and children. It doesn't say anything about children here, but you tell me what happens to the children in that house. If, 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 if the mom and the dad are dragged off, committing them to prison. So this very effective persecution against the church benefits from solid, committed leadership, and let her be leverage. The frenzy has leverage, namely the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. A movement, a ministry can be effective and sustained to a rather remarkable extent by one person who is committed to lead. But it really helps if that leader has leverage. And Saul's leverage is the clear backing of the state. 
Saul is going to do what he does as an agent of the government. We're going to see in the next chapter that although the frenzy is spontaneous... Verse 1 of our text does indeed say it arises, it, 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 it springs forth out of this insanity against Stephen and an object in motion tends to remain in motion. So once they rushed and killed Stephen, they can't just coast to a stop. They keep on going covered in Stephen's blood to seek the blood of everyone like Stephen and to seek the blood of, of the entire Jesus movement the same Jesus who they cried out for his blood too. And so, yes, there's certainly a spontaneous uh, a quality to this frenzy, but it very, very quickly gains the leverage of official organization. And in the next chapter, we'll see that orders are written up by the Sanhedrin, giving Saul, think about this, Governmental authority, governmental backing. That would include financial backing. Saul is going to quickly rise to fame as a leader with leverage in his persecution of the church. So just as the church had gotten organized by appointing apostles and deacons, Satan imitates that by building his bureaucracy of opposition. So Saul is a tremendous leader, yes, but now he has a bureaucracy and a budget. He has power and provision. So this frenzy, this great persecution against the church at Jerusalem, it has traction. It has life. And that's letter C. The frenzy has life. And the life takes the form of savagery. Savagery. Verse 1 of chapter 9. See, we don't, I can't resist sometimes looking forward and pulling stuff back but for the I'm trying to resist it for the most part but verse 1 of chapter 9 says I, I want you to see the life of this it says that Saul is breathing threats he's breathing murder this anti church movement in Jerusalem has vital life it has breath listen it has commitment it's not just a it's not just a casual like resisting of the church. It's not just like an attempt to censor the church. There's tremendous savagery here. I mentioned that verse 3 in the New King James translation says Saul made havoc of the church. Other translations say he laid waste the church. He ravaged the church. These translations are a rendering of the original Greek word. Listen carefully. It has a literal meaning of to loosen or break up with violence. To loosen or break up with violence. The word comes from agriculture. It's just the image of taking a hard, sharp object and hacking away at the ground to loosen it, to break it up, in preparation for planting. So the language Luke uses in verse 3 tells us that Saul began to hack away violently at the church. It's, it's savagery. And such savagery, such enthusiasm in what one is doing comes, I would suggest to you, from passion and even pleasure. Up in verse 1, we see Saul, the new King James says, he's consenting to Stephen's death, but I want you to hear some other translations of that too. The New American Standard Bible says Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. Other translations say he approved of Stephen dying. 
The original Greek word does indeed carry nuances of both approval and pleasure. So Saul is not only doing what he's doing to the church because of perceived duty, he's also doing it because it's his passion and it brings him pleasure. He will later use the word zeal. In Philippians 3, 6, he says concerning zeal, he was persecuting the church. Now, hang with me. We're almost to the point of seeing how this gets to us. The Greek word translated zeal here refers to heat, refers to passion. Most of us in this room, if we were asked, we would profess to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The very presence of whom this book of Acts represents by fire, heat. But the question now I have to ask myself is, how does my, how does your zeal, how does your passion for the church compare to this lost man's zeal, this lost man's passion against the church. I, I mean, if, if, if I'm really indwelled by the spirit of the resurrected, glorified Christ Jesus who loves the church and adores the church and spilled his blood for the church, then shouldn't my zeal, shouldn't my passion, shouldn't my efforts to bless the church and edify the church far exceed even Saul's efforts to destroy the church? Shouldn't I take more pleasure in the church than even Saul takes pleasure in hacking away at the church? So we have to ask hard questions. Why is what the church, I don't mean just this one, but why is what the church is doing from week to week why is it met with so much indifference and proverbial yawning? Why does it seem so easy for so many to say no to the church in so many different ways with such regularity? Where is our zeal? Verse 1 says, a great persecution arises against the church. Well, brethren, we rather desperately need a great passion to arise in our day for the church by those who say they are of the church. Zechariah 8.2 Thus says the Lord of hosts, I, says the Lord, am zealous for Zion with great zeal. That, that word Zion referring to the church in this case. I am zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor, says Jesus. I am zealous for her. That's the words of our Lord who John 2.17 teaches us is the fulfillment of Psalm 69.9. He is the one who is consumed. He is the one who is eaten up with zeal for the church to a greater extent than Saul was consumed with zeal against the church. And if we are indwelled by his spirit, then where is our passion for the church? Where is our zeal? I'm not just speaking about those here. But certainly not excluding us. One contemporary writer offers the following. Many churches in America are looking less like armies engaged in war and more like lazy boy chairs from which drowsy Christians are saying, don't wake me up. Who among us hasn't seen this decay? Who cannot see a difference between the ancient church and us? 
In former days, a fire burned within Christians, but our hearts seldom, if ever, seemed to burn within us. Formerly, Christians seemed driven by a holy passion, but now little seems to motivate us. I'm still quoting, Christians of old were at war with their sin and strove for holiness by heavenly strength. But we seem to tolerate sin rather easily and are satisfied to do the minimum of what God requires of us. This writer asks, what has happened? God did not change. The power of salvation did not change. The call to holiness did not change. The threat of the enemy did not change. So why are so many Christians, he asks, drowsy rather than being on fire for God? Now there's a lot of possible answers to that question. But what says Jesus? Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If you feel rebuked this morning, if you feel chastened as I do, praise the Lord. Amen? It's, it's a product of the love that Christ has for us. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, that command is problematic. It's, it's problematic because how can a person without zeal be zealous? Right? If, if, if I'm reading this and, and, and I'm confessing my lack of zeal and this says, I mean, it's like telling, it's like telling a weak man to be strong. Well, uh, okay. How, how can I be strong? I'm not strong. So how can one without zeal be zealous? Now, the Bible does give us the answers, praise the Lord. First, are you ready for this? It's profound. Ask for it. That's the first thing the Bible says, is to zeal for the church. Zeal for Christ is a grace and therefore cannot be obtained, but must be given, must be granted. And God's graces are given to us in and through Christ, listen, as we ask for them. As we ask for them. You don't have the zeal for the church that you want to have. James 4, 2 says... You don't have because you don't ask. We lack zeal, different degrees, but I think it's safe to say all of us, we, we, we lack zeal. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, are we even asking for it? Are we even asking for it? Have we, uh, are we, will we, from this day, will we pray for zeal? Will we pray for passion for the church which exceeds Saul's persecution of the church? Will we pray for it? Somewhere around the turn of the 17th century, a guy named John Preston writes, if we sincerely wish to be inflamed with zeal for God, we must humble ourselves before Him, believe His word to be truth, acknowledge our need and His bounty, confess our sin and His mercy and our unworthiness and His grace, and ask Him for the sake of the Lord Jesus to give us this grace, to enliven us and inflame all our affections by His Holy Spirit who indwells us that we might pursue His glory. We must pray and pray and ask and ask for this heat, for this, this passion, this zeal to be ours for God's glory. But then, brethren, as almost all of us know from experience, we must engage the means of grace to sustain what God grants. 
We must engage the means of grace to sustain what God grants by grace. The reading and personal and corporate study of the Bible, increasing the frequency with which we gather with the church and repentance and resistance against sin. Listen, please, to what Paul says to the church in 2 Corinthians 7, and then we'll close. I'll tell you, will you just turn there, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning with verse 8, and we'll close here. Two Corinthians chapter seven, verse eight. The Apostle Paul has written letter to the church at Corinth, more than one. And in one of the letters, he evidently has written to them about hard things about things which would be very um, convicting to them. He's written to them about their sin. And in verse 8 he says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. You know how, you know how that's phrased today? Sorry, not sorry. That's what he's saying. He said, I am sorry because I... I Paul loves, he loves this church. He has no desire to bring up anything negative that's going on within them. He loves them so much. He says, so I'm really sorry that I made you sorry. But on the other hand, I really can't say I'm sorry. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. As I studied this great, the initial stage of this great persecution against the church, I was sorrowful because I saw in Saul a passion a pleasure a zeal against the church that was greater than my passion for the church and it made me sorry it, it, it made me sorrowful verse 9 still for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Praise the Lord. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. People ask me sometimes, what's the difference between conviction and guilt? Here it is. Conviction, which comes from the Holy Spirit, leads to me being sorrowful. It leads to me repenting. It leads to my ultimate salvation. So I don't regret that awful feeling that I have sometimes called conviction. Guilt, though, is not from the Holy Spirit. It is from the world and produces nothing but death. Verse 11. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. Praise the Lord. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourself. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. You who are reading the same translation I am, what's next? What zeal. What zeal it produced in you. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Brothers and sisters, this is not an optional thing before us. This obtaining and sustaining of zeal for the Christ and for 
his body and his bride, the church. This is not an optional thing for us. We are either going to flame out or we are going to fizzle out. One or the other. We're going out of this world either way. We saw that last week, right? We want to we wanna die the death of the righteous. We want to die like Stephen died, ultimately like Jesus died. With our eyes on glory, dying full of God, dying free of grudges, all that stuff we looked at last week. We know that we're going out either way, but when it comes to our passion for the body and bride of Jesus, we're either going to go out in spiritual flames or we're going to go out in a spiritual flicker and fizzle. In Matthew 11, 12, Jesus says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent, the zealous, the passionate, those who are filled with heat for the church, take the kingdom by force. The spiritually violent in a good way. Those who are on fire for the Lord and for the church are those who will take the kingdom of God. So let's be zealous and repent. And repent and be zealous. Amen? Would you stand?